So you have for decades the US Air Force generals deciding the fate of each new design of aircraft. You end up having good choices made, like the P-51 Mustang, that is still today a woman magnet. <laughs> And you also have not so good choices, like the case of the Air Force Phantom, a fighter jet without cannons. Now, what the Air Force generals didn't expect was this man. I went in there, closed the door, I didn't want to have the secretary listen to my nasty words. And I said, look, I went through this very carefully. Said, you know what? I've never designed an airplane before, but I could fuck up and do better than this. He went straight up. This is John Boyd, also known as the man who created the Fighter Mafia. And this is the story of the S-16 Fighter Falcon. Picture this. It's the end of 1960s. Men just landed on the moon, the United States was increasing its presence in the Vietnam War, and a couple years before, we almost pressed the red button resetting life on Earth. What can you expect to come out of all this? Well, at the time, the main fighter jet for the US Navy was the Air Force Phantom, which was not doing so good at the beginning of the Vietnam War. But how the mightiest Air Force in the world was losing fighters to the North Vietnamese Air Force? Among other factors, there is a simple answer. The Air Force generals and engineers back in 1958 decided that the development of the Air Force would not include a very important feature in a fighter jet. Cannons. Yes, the cannons that we always see in the movies. And they decided not to include that because the idea of the time was that the missiles would do all the job and why include the cannon? with all this unnecessary extra weight. So now you have the US fighting a war in the other side of the world and not performing well at the start. The easiest and more effective decision was to include the cannon in the Air and voila! All of a sudden, like the press of a magic button, the United States Air Force and the Navy started to gain supremacy over the skies of the South and North Vietnam. But still, those pilots who experienced the dogfights at the beginning of the war didn't forget the total screw-up made from the top brass in Washington DC. And now we have another thing in the pot to spice up the whole situation. Suddenly, over the skies of the Soviet Union, a new design of a fighter jet showed up, the MiG-25. This fighter jet was designed to intercept long-range bombers threatening the Soviet Union. And all the US Air Force and US Navy got was an aged fighter jet. The Air Force needed to be replaced by a new fighter that could outperform the MiG-25 in long-range engagements and at the same time outperform any fighter jet in close combat scenario. Enters in scene the F-14 Tomcat. The F-14 outperformed every aspect of the F-4 Phantom and quickly became recognized as the best dogfighter of its time, gaining even more popularity after the movie Top Gun. So far everything was roses for the F-14 Tomcat. He got the fame, the girls and the best close encounters with the enemy. What could go wrong, right? Well, the F-14 Tomcat was a good fit for the Navy but not the Air Force. And that, my friends, is a perfect opportunity for a man with vision shine. John Boyd, a veteran of the Korean War with not a single kill on record as a saber pilot. A veteran of the Vietnam War despite of his duty not involve direct air combat. How a guy with this resume became a legend in the aviation world. Well, to put it simply, he was known for defeating any pilot within the first 40 seconds in a dogfight. He developed the tactics and techniques used to this day for aerial combat. And lastly, he started the Fata Mafia. He was a natural maverick. His superiors didn't like his way of doing things. So the Pentagon, with the opening of the program to replace the F-14 Tomcat and the Air Force Phantom, selected a bunch of new designs. 
and some generals had idea to call Boyd to take a look. I went in there, closed the door, I didn't want to have a secretary listen to my nasty words. And I said, look, I went through this very carefully. Because you know what? I've never designed an airplane before. But I could fuck up and do better than this. He went straight up. Now that Boyd took a look and gave his opinion to the Pentagon, he knew he was in the game. So he quickly mounted a team of intellectuals, including fighter pilots, engineers and mathematicians, that together would produce the basis of one of the best air superiority fighter jets to this day, the F-15. Oh, the F-15 is an absolute dream to fly. It was so exhilarating and so sexy and just incredible. The F-15 became the Cadillac of the skies. No one would dare to mess with the United States. The pilots felt that they were truly dominating the area. I remember for the first uh, two or three years that I flew the F-15, having constantly the thought in the cockpit, well, we got this right, well, we got this right. They are all for different things, and my fellow pilots had the same thoughts. Well, we really fixed this, we really fixed this. But there was a problem. The F-15 was too expensive to be in every squadron of the Air Force. So the Pentagon created a new program to have a cost-effective fighter jet that could pair up with the F-15. So we have John Boyd, a guy that during the development of the F-15 accessed unauthorized documents from the military and treated the top brass of the Air Force like this. But I could fuck up and do better than this. Boyd worked with the mathematician Thomas Christie to develop the famous energy maneuverability theory. This groundbreaking work enables fighter pilots to evaluate their energy potential at any altitude and in any maneuver, as well as the energy potential of their aerial adversary. Colonel Boyd goes on to show how his theory can be used as an effective tool for designing new fighter aircraft. The approach emphasizes an aircraft capable of quick changes in speed, altitude and direction. Boyd and a group of like-minded innovators from a small advocacy group within the US Air Force dubbed the Lightweight Fighter Mafia. They conceived the Lightweight Fighter Program in 1969. They secured funding from the Air Force to validate their theory. General Dynamics receives $149,000 and Northrop $100,000 to develop design concepts that embody Boyd's energy maneuverability theory for a small, low-drag, lightweight pure fighter. The concept gains political support from the Deputy Secretary of Defense in May 1971. He established an Air Force prototype study group, which will fund two of the proposals. And on the 6th of June 1972, the U.S. Defense Department seeks submissions from the aviation industry. Five companies respond, and in March, the Air Staff announces that the winners for the prototype development and testing phase are Northrop and General Dynamics. Northrop works in collaboration with McDonnell Douglas to design a twin-engine lightweight fighter that employs two separate tail fins, giving an appearance similar to the F-15. The design is given the Air Force prefix YF-17, and they place an order for two prototypes. The General Dynamics concept employs a single-engine design of the same type used in the twin-engine F-15. The model is designated YF-16, and two prototypes are ordered. Both companies are given contracts of over $30 million to produce the competing models. So in 1973, the first YF-16 prototype rolled out of the General Dynamics assembly line, and already in 1974, it was delivered to the Edwards Air Force Base for testing with the first flight scheduled for the 2nd of February. However, the schedule was wrecked when an accident occurred in January during the flight test. The prototype was passing through a series of tests of high-speed runs during which the engine systems and landing gear were being checked. So far so good, 
but in a split of a second, the aircraft lost stability and began to swing and screech in the ground with its wing tip and tail stabilizer. The pilot, seeing all this and knowing that at this speed the plane would most likely crash, brought the engine to the maximum and took off. And six minutes later, all ended well, with the aircraft landing smoothly. Even though everything went fine, General Dynamics was not happy about it. They just came from a fierce competition and they would not let their image be damaged by this incident. So on February 2nd, as it was planned in front of dozens of reporters, the YF-16 took off and General Dynamics called it its real first flight. Three days later, the official first flight, the YF-16 broke the sound barrier and things were about to be even better. Belgium, Denmark, Norway and the Netherlands formed the Multinational Fighter Program Group to select a replacement for the aging F-104 Starfighter. They indicate that the winner of the lightweight fighter contest will be the favorite candidate. And in September, the Air Force announces that they plan to purchase 650 of whichever aircraft is chosen for the air combat fighter. In January, the Air Force announces the selection of the YF-16 and its overall performance of the F-16 prototypes that impressed the Department of Defense. A pre-production order of 15 aircraft is placed, with the prospect of to purchase 650 aircraft over the next 5 years. Per Northrop design is not scrapped forever. The YF-17 would eventually evolve to the F-A-18 Hornet. The air combat fighter competition in January 1975 showed the reasons why the F-16 was selected as the winner. The flight test program reveals the YF-16 superior acceleration, climb rates, endurance and turning ability. During the development, both manufacturers were aware that the aging F-104 Starfighter will soon need to be replaced. The F-104 equipped several European NATO air forces, so the replacement will be the fighter deal of this century. In May 1975, the prototype made its first transatlantic flight for a sales tour to potential NATO customers. The Paris Air Show offered an ideal opportunity to display the YF-16's ability to European clients. At the air show, General Dynamics chief test pilot Neil Anderson thrilled the crowd and impressed experts with the red, white and blue lightweight fighter. Many countries have been studying the design for some time, and they were looking for a replacement fighter that offered economy without sacrificing performance. After intense international competition among manufacturers, NATO countries adopted the General Dynamics design. By the end of the air show, European Air Forces signed up for 348 F-16s. With substantial orders on hand, General Dynamics' Fort Worth plant goes into top gear and the first F-16 single-seat model rolled out in December 1976 for testing. When the plane was finished, it represented the last word in technological design. At about 18,000 pounds, the aircraft is extremely lightweight, thanks to the use of advanced aluminum alloys. The cockpit has several features not seen in earlier fighters. Provisions are made to reduce the stress force on pilots, as their F-16 maneuver sharp turns and sudden acceleration can put the pilot's body under severe stress from G-forces. Higher G-forces can cause problems with blood circulation and present a serious threat to the pilot. At 2 Gs, the pilot begins to lose peripheral vision, and by 6, he's in danger of blacking out. To improve the pilot's tolerance of G-forces, the seat is laid back at an angle of 30 degrees. This distributes the pilot weight over a greater area and creates pressure for the blood to return to the heart. The cockpit layout makes information readily available to enhance the pilot's situational awareness. 
The heads-up display, or HUD, projects visual flight and combat information onto the weapon's sight glass, directly in front of the pilot without obstructing his view. The design also places controls at the pilot's fingertips, so during a fight he never needs to look down into the cockpit. For easy and accurate control of the aircraft during the high-G combat maneuvers, the side stick controller is used instead of the conventional center mount stick. The F-16 also employs an advanced radar for search weapons control and guidance. General Dynamics recognized the maximum visibility can provide a small edge that today dogfighters need over their opponents. The one-piece bubble canopy is one of the most subtle yet beneficial features of the F-16 design. It provides 360-degree all-around visibility. The wing and fuselage blend into each other, creating a single modular unit by having a smooth transition from wing to fuselage. This aerodynamic feature gives the S-16 an improved performance at high angles of attack. The phenomenal maneuverability and agility that allows the F-16 pilots outperform all other aircraft is the result of the blending of the two new science fly-by-wire electrical operation of the aircraft's control surfaces and the relaxed static stability. When both of these innovations work together with the S-16 electronics and automatic flight controls, the result puts the aircraft in a class of its own. The high-tech F-16 also uses a digital flight control concept. The flight control computer accepts the pilot's input from the stick and rudder controls, and manipulates the control surfaces to produce the desired result without inducing a loss of control. They had certain advancements already by the time the F-16 was fielded, and one of them was the digital flight control concept. The F-16 was the first one to have that kind of system. The airplane was able to be designed what's called statically unstable, so it can't fly unless it has assistance of the computer. Computer actually controls all the flight control surfaces, sending signals to the hydraulics that move those surfaces, which is a direct contrast to how all previous airplanes were done. The F-16 is the first plane completely controlled by a computer, and many pilots call it the electric plane. It is also the first aircraft to feature a thrust-to-weight ratio greater than 1 to 1, providing enough power to climb and accelerate vertically at the same time. Quick turnaround speed is essential for any modern day fighter. Its ability to land quickly, refuel and rearm is fundamental to its effectiveness in combat. Because the manufacturers incorporate technologies that are already proven in aircraft like the F-15 and F-111, it allowed designers to simplify the airplane and reduce its size, purchase price, maintenance costs and weight. The aviation industries of the four participating European nations also benefit from the F-16 success through subcontracting licensing and ultimate assembly. The first and major assembly line is at General Dynamics plant in Fort Worth, Texas. The program is large and complex. Scale models must be used to achieve effective workflow as production and assembly get underway. European manufacturers also begin construction. In August 1978, the first fully operational F-16 rolls off the line and begins pre-acceptance trials. And on January 23, 1979, the 388th Tactical Fighter Wing at Hill Air Force Base in Utah receives the first F-16. Hill Air Force Base holds the official naming ceremony for the new fighter on July 21, 1980, and the F-16 is formally named Fighter Falcon after the mascot for the United States Air Force Academy. Within weeks, other NATO Air Forces received their own planes. Increased interest in the F-16 spawns orders from around the world. In 1979, Iran orders 160 aircraft, but after a change in power, the United States cancels the order. Eventually, 79 aircraft from their order find their way to the Israeli Air Force. 
the F-16 quickly becomes the standard fighter for countries who do not produce their own aircraft. Now the F-16 is becoming the standard airframe for countries who do not produce their own aircraft, but these countries demand more than just a fighter. In 1979, the F-16 enters service as a representation of the latest technology excelling in both dogfighting and ground attacks. Mindful of the dogfight mission, it is equipped with the cannon and missiles, offering a staggering array of potential configurations. The F-16 is armed with the M-61 Vulcan 20mm cannon in the left-wing route and up to six AM-9 Sidewinder heat-seeking short-range air-to-air missiles. It also carries a wide variety of air-to-ground missiles, rockets or bombs. In addition to its traditional fighter role, pilots soon realized that the F-16 is highly effective in air-to-ground scenarios. In air-to-air -air combat role, the F-16 maneuverability exceeds all potential threat fighter aircrafts. In an air-to-ground role, it can fly more than 500 miles to deliver its weapons with superior accuracy and defend itself against enemy aircraft. So it's not surprising when the F-16 is chosen to participate in 1981 technical bombing competition at Lossiemouth in Scotland. Considered by some to be the penultimate competition of its kind. The competition focuses on the ground attack capabilities of two types of aircraft from Britain and two from the US. Still new and fairly unknown, the F-16 must compete against contenders with proven performance. The Jaguar is Britain's state-of-the-art ground attack aircraft. And another contender is General Dynamics F-111 swing-wing bomber which comes from the same stable as the F-16. At the time, the F-111 is the Air Force's number one attack aircraft, capable of striking any fixed or moving target with a range of over 1,000 nautical miles. Employed by the Royal Air Force, the British twin-engine Buccaneer is a veteran with many years of service as naval attack bomber. The F-16 won the accuracy competition, even against a dedicated ground attack Jaguar. But the competition does not only test bomb accuracy, it involves all aspects of combat readiness and effectiveness, navigation in aircraft, turnaround, pilot skills and tactics. In all aspects, the F-16 established itself with breathtaking effectiveness by the time the final results are calculated. General Dynamics' brilliant lightweight wins the number one position in the final formation. However, the success of the S-16 at Lossiemouth does not come as a complete surprise. About a week before the competition, the Israeli Air Force demonstrated the F-16 bombing potential during Operation Babylon. This is the F-16's first combat mission worldwide. On the afternoon of June 7, 1981, Israeli fighter planes prepare for a surprise airstrike that would deprive the Iraqis of atomic weapons. The target is a nuclear reactant in Osirak, in Iraq, where nuclear fuel can be converted into plutonium for atom bombs. The mission calls for eight F-16s, each carrying 2,000-pound bombs and six F-15s that serve as fighter escorts to protect the bomb-laden Falcons. One by one, the Falcons bomb find their marks and less than two minutes the plant is destroyed by 16 tons of TNT. The bombs penetrated the plutonium processing plant and caused the reactor to collapse. The success of the mission brings attention to the F-16's flawless maneuvering and fly-by-wire controls. And this is the only the beginning of the Fighting Falcon rise to glory. The F-16 first to air combat success comes on April 28, 1981, when the Israeli Air Force shoots down a Syrian Mi-8 helicopter with cannon fire. In 1982, Israeli F-16s demonstrate their fighter ability when Syria threatens Israel. 
Together with the Israeli Air Force Eagles and F-4s, they devastate Syrian fighters in a classic dogfight situation. One-on-one -on -one Syrian MiGs are simply no match for Israeli F-16s. Due to its astounding maneuverability, the United States Air Force quickly finds another role for the versatile fighter. On April 2, 1983, the U.S. Air Force Air Demonstration Squadron flies its first public show with the F-16. The Thunderbirds were activated in 1953 to present aerial maneuvers that exhibit the capabilities of high-performance Air Force aircraft. During the Soviet-Afghan War, Pakistani Air Force F-16s shot down Afghan and Soviet ground attack and transport aircraft operated in the Pakistani airspace between May 1986 and December 1988. During Operation Desert Storm, the F-16 is known as the workhorse of the war. It executes 25% of all strike sorties throughout the war, averaging 300 to 400 a day. The Fighting Falcon is credited with 13,500 sorties, more than any other aircraft. In March of 1993, Lockheed buys General Dynamics and merges with another company to become Lockheed Martin. This new company continues to make F-16s. When Desert Storm ends, the United States Air Force F-16s begin patrolling direct no-fly zones. NATO F-16C saw action during the Bosnian War peacekeeping operations in 1994-1995, flying ground attack missions and enforcing the no-fly zone over Bosnia. F-16s returned to Iraq in December 1998 as part of the Operation Desert Fox, bombing campaign to degrade Iraq's ability to manufacture and use weapons of mass destruction. With the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, the F-16 have flown continuous all-weather operations that accomplished precision strike mission objectives. The F-16 provides more proven combat capability and affordability than any other multi-role fighter available in the world. Today, the F-16 evolves through four generations to become one of the most capable multi-role fighters available, building upon its legendary combat record of 72 victories and zero losses. In 2005, the 2231st and last F-16 rolled out of the production plant, built for the United States Air Force. The F-16 continues to serve the U.S. and other 23 nations around the world. Lockheed Martin and U.S. Air Force are committed to the modification and sustainment of the worldwide F-16 fleet, continuous technology and enhancements, upgrades, and global sustainment. Allowing the F-16 to perform as a comprehensive weapon system that makes the difference in the battlefields. For the U.S. Air Force and abroad, the Fighting Falcon has proven itself in vigorous exercises and in actual combat to be one of the greatest single-engine combat fighters since the arrival of the jet. Thanks to men like John Boyd and his team, legends were born and forever will be remembered. Thank you for watching and good night.